I'm very delighted to speak to Political Capital today, uh, live from Athens. Obviously, the coronavirus has ensured that uh, I couldn't be there in Budapest, so uh, I'm sad that I wasn't able to come, but still happy that I'm still able to address you all. So I'd like to talk about uh, the subject of disinformation, something that actually, with the current crisis we're all going through, has become acutely relevant, even more so than it is usually, and it's pretty relevant usually. So I want to talk about uh, disinformation taking my book, uh, War in 140 Characters, How Social Media is Reshaping Conflict uh, in the 21st Century, taking that as a starting point. Now this book was born out of my experiences covering the war in Ukraine between Russia and Ukraine, which is a conflict, a war in all but name. Uh, I went there in 2014, and uh, what I thought was going to be the coverage of a very traditional war turned out to be something else entirely. Uh, the longer I spent in Ukraine traveling to the, the war zones in the east, the more that I understood that I was dealing with two wars. One that was fought on the ground with soldiers and tanks and bullets, and the other that was fought in cyberspace with tweets and posts and shares. And what I realized, actually, in the end, was that the latter battle, the online battle, the battle with tweets and posts and shares was far more important to the overarching goals of, of Russia, Vladimir Putin, the Kremlin, than the warfare on the ground. Now, why is this? Well, I thought about this long and hard. I'd, I'd seen conflict in the Congo. I, I, I'd you know, known about it in the Middle East. I'd, I'd, I'd covered the Middle East for many years. Uh, and I understood that what I was seeing was a different type of conflict, a conflict that actually seems to be very, very particular, very, very relevant in the 21st century. And that is a conflict in which military victory was not the goal. Now, when Russia, when Russian soldiers without insignias marched into Crimea, seized the municipal buildings and eventually annexed it from Ukraine, they could have taken, should they wish, Ukraine in, as a, secu a Ukrainian security official told me, had Russia wanted to take Ukraine at that time, it could have done so in days. The Ukrainian army was in a state, corruption was rife, uh, they had uh, uh, jeeps without engines because the engines had been taken out and sold. But here's the thing, Vladimir Putin never sought a military victory against Ukraine. He sought something else. What he wanted to do was he wanted to destabilize Ukraine. He wanted to prevent Ukraine from ever being stable enough to join NATO or the EU. And the way he sought to do this was to destabilize the country. Now, how is this? Now, they wanted Crimea. Russia, since Crimea was given to Ukraine, has always wanted Crimea. So they took that. But they never wanted East Ukraine. What they decided to do was to destabilize the entire state by sending military hardware into eastern Ukraine so they could clear a space to pump in a narrative unfiltered. And that narrative was a very particular narrative. It said several things. It said that the Kiev government was a fascist junta. The government, remember, the, 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 because the people had risen up and overthrown uh, Yanukovych, who had subsequently fled to, to Russia. The government was a fascist junta. The government wanted to stop the speaking of Russian in Ukraine. The government wanted to persecute and perhaps even kill ethnic Russian speakers. That was the narrative. And with that narrative, the Kremlin was able to set Ukrainian against Ukraine, East Ukraine against West Ukraine, was able to divide the country, was able to destabilize it. And that, more than the tanks on the ground, more than the soldiers on the street, was what the source of Russia's war against Ukraine was. It was primarily an information war. Now, why is information war so relevant to the contemporary age? Well, look, uh, propaganda, disinformation, whatever you want to call it, that has been around since, I mean, you know, information warfare is as old as warfare itself. Sun Tzu talks about it. Uh, you know, the, the, the propagandists of classical antiquity we know about. But information warfare is becoming very relevant in the modern age because of several things. First of all, Industrial-scale slaughter, like we saw in World War II, cripples the world. It cripples countries. It ended Britain as a, as a great power. And it upsets the entire world. Nobody wants mass, wild-scale wars anymore. Nobody can afford it. And we live in an era where, politically, countries, leaders can't see their soldiers coming back in body bags. Vladimir Putin cannot accept the political cost of thousands of Russians coming back dead. Uh, Russia, the Soviet Union experienced this in the Afghanistan conflict, and it was a disaster. The second reason is information warfare 
it favors a particular type of state. And that is the type of big former imperial state that believes it has a place at the high table, but no longer lacks the means to challenge with hard power. And classic cases like this are Russia, a former great imperial power, a former superpower that still wants to challenge America, but has no chance of doing that on the, on the battlefield, has no chance of doing that uh, with hard power, has no chance of doing that in traditional warfare. Another example is, is Iran, another imperial power that seeks to challenge the status quo. What information warfare allows is these states to challenge the United States, to challenge the West, to challenge NATO at a fraction of the cost that it would otherwise cost, that it would otherwise incur. You know, Russia can never do anything against America on the battlefield. But in 2016, it looks like it, it infiltrated to the heart of the American system, that is, its elections. Now, this is why in the modern world where mass deaths are impermissible, where mass war is since the Second World War seemed unthinkable, this is why it favors states like Russia. The second thing is how do we fight in the modern world is asymmetrical conflict. State on state war, again, because of the legacy of World War II, is very rare. Most wars that the West fight, most wars that America fights, that Britain fights, are asymmetrical conflicts. Against uh, Israel fights against Hamas. Uh, the West coalition fights against Daesh, ISIS, whatever you want to call it. It fights against Al Qaeda. And again, these non-state actors, information warfare is a very powerful tool. Uh, ISIS is called the digital caliphate. Uh, at, you know, at, at its peak, thousands of people were going every week to join ISIS. This is a state of affairs that simply would not have happened 10 years ago. And it was all to do with their very, very impressive digital operation. And the reason, of course, finally, the digital, the, 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 the information warfare has become so prevalent is that we are in the grips, the midst of an information revolution. The first 20 years of the 21st century, when history is written, I suppose will, will, will be about two things, really. I mean, the rise of China, which we tend not to think about in our sort of Western centric view, and the digital revolution. The digital revolution has enabled everybody to weaponize information has enabled everyone to become an information actor. And this is because of the, of the phenomenon I term homo digitalis, which I talk about in my book. Now, homo digitalis is the hyper-empowered hyper -empowered networked individual, man or woman, that through the power of the digital, digital revolution, the information revolution, is able to exercise disproportionate power at the individual level. Now, what does this mean? It means that ordinary people can do potentially extraordinary things. I say potentially because obviously this is not the case of every, for everybody. Most people carry on much the same as before, but digital tools have allowed everyone to become broadcasters. Anyone can get on Twitter and broadcast to an audience. Now, some will say this means that the digital revolution has democratized everything. This is actually not true. The hierarchies that exist in real life exist on Twitter and Facebook. I have you know, 15, 20,000 followers. So I'm deemed more credible than someone that has maybe 200 followers. At the same time, the BBC, which has millions of followers, is deemed far more credible than me. There are hierarchies. But through these tools, individuals can exercise power that would once been unthinkable. And I'm going to give you one example. I want you to all think about this. And that is Elliot Higgins, <coughs> the blogger at Higgins, Bellingcat, who I'm sure you all know. Now, Elliot Higgins, when he started out, was a chap, a guy, in literally his bedroom, his, his living room, in, you know, with a computer. That was all he had. He was in his room, he had a computer and obsessive personality. Now, when the flight MH17 was shot down over eastern Ukraine by, as we now know, a book missile supplied to separatists by the Russian military, it was Elliot Higgins that picked up on this. It was Elliot Higgins that used open source information to forensically show, and this is the key, to show the world how Russia did it. He actually was able, in the end, to track the course of that missile from Kursk in Russia all the way down to the field in East Ukraine where it was shot and all the way back. Now, this was vital. And it was so important that Russia was forced to set up several press conferences specifically to rebut his findings. So I want you to think about that. The government of the world's largest country had to set up specific press conferences to counteract the work of this guy, Elliot Higgins, this man on his own with just a few other guys in their own houses. This is a state of, you know, all possible through online tools, open source tools, tools available to everybody. And what makes this so important is look, 
Elliot Higgins, the intelligence services knew what had happened. They knew what had happened. But the point is they couldn't say it and they couldn't show it. And we live in a world where because of the Iraq war, intelligence services are under suspicion. Because of Edward Snowden, intelligence services are under suspicion. But Elliot Higgins came out and showed it. And it cost Russia dearly in the court of public opinion. Elliot Higgins is homo digitalis writ large. He is the hyper-empowered, networked individual that is able to exercise disproportionate power at the individual level. And we can see them being used for good and ill. Uh, the Russian state also harnesses the power of homo digitalis. It takes lines and lines, rows and rows of homo digitalis, puts them into its troll farms, and lets them, and leashes them into an information war. And what you are seeing right now, and what I want to sort of bring this into the contemporary moment, is you're seeing a huge amount of information warfare around the coronavirus. This is something that I looked at recently, and this is something I wrote in an article for the British magazine, The Spectator, just a couple of days ago. Now, coronavirus is a horrific pandemic that is strafing the world. And unfortunately, it's something else. It's a gift to propagandists. Every propagandist, every disinformation actor is now jumping on the coronavirus bandwagon. Why? Because coronavirus has several qualities. First of all, it is transfixing the world. If you write about coronavirus, the chances are people will read it. If you write about something other than coronavirus, a lot less people will read it. We are literally captive audiences, stuck in our home, unable to go out, terrified of a virus that we fear may kill millions of us. So you use coronavirus to get your message heard. You piggyback onto it. The second thing about coronavirus, it's invisible. This means you can put onto it the face of whatever enemy you want. It's the ultimate empty signifier. So I'm looking at the space. I'm looking at the disinformation space. I'm seeing the Iranians <coughs> use coronavirus to say that the, it is an American disease that the Americans have manufactured in order to divide Iran from its sheer brethren in Iraq. I'm looking at Russian disinformation actors, Kremlin disinformation actors, who are using coronavirus to sow, to sow mistrust and division in the West. They are using the virus to say that Western emergency services can't cope, that they are under siege, and that everything is more dangerous because of the incompetence of Western emergency and medical services. I'm seeing the Chinese use it to defend their autocratic regimes, saying again that the disease originates in America and is an attempt to stymie the development and the great economic progress of the Chinese state. Coronavirus is a gift to propagandists, it's a gift to disinformation actors, and it is something that is being weaponized all around us. And because of homo digitalis, because of the digital revolution, because of information technology and its advances, it is rife. This is why we have to understand as practitioners, as experts, as policymakers, as politicians, and as just concerned citizens, the scale of the disinformation problem we are facing, the seriousness of the disinformation problem we're facing, and the fact that it is only just beginning. We are, as I said at the beginning of this talk, in the midst of a revolution, an information technology revolution, and we are still very much in the beginnings. I say to people, I, when I give a talk, how long was cinema, how long were movies silent for? And the answer is 30 years. Social media, the, the real weapon of choice in the information sphere for disinformation actors, is about 10, 11, 12 years old. We're still very much in its infancy. We still don't understand how to deal with it. We still don't understand how to regulate it properly, let alone legislate for it. I want everyone to understand that <coughs> the problem is serious, but it's going to get a lot worse. And it's something that we can fight back against using the tools of countering this information, good information, fact-checking, mapping of networks, all these tools that we're familiar with. But it is something that we're going to have to accept is going to get a lot worse. And it's something that we are seeing with coronavirus is only at its very beginnings. Many thanks.